Thought and memory. My ravens fly every day the whole world over. Each day I fear that thought might not return, but I fear more for memory. A pretty heavy quote there to begin a YouTube video with, but that's what this series is all about. I want to remember and reconstruct the forgotten gods and religions of my homeland. That sounds kind of ashy. I want to remember and reconstruct the gods of my... Netherlands? Country? Place of birth? What's an anarchist way of saying homeland? Nonetheless, in our modern time we perceive religion in a very monotheistic sense. Uh, gen generally we take things like there's only one god and you need a book and uh, you pray by putting your hands together. Uh, as axiomatic, that is to say we, um, it's kind of a no-brainer, like, of course a religion has a book, of course a religion has a place of worship, and of course there's only one god, it's a very Abrahamic way of thinking. This is the notion that I want to challenge with this series, I want to frame the people that lived here as n not barbarians, but people with genuinely held beliefs. But we're also here to learn about a cool warrior goddess. So, let's get into this. Let's talk Baduhenna. To really understand this goddess, we have to put her in the context of her time, which was roughly around 28 uh, Common Era, which was four years before the biblical crucifixion of Christ and at the height of the Roman Empire. This was a time when one large state with, a, with one religion controlled an area from Judea to Spain to the Rhine. This was a very odd time for polytheism. What happened was due to both the Great Migration and um, this one large polytheistic state. Hey, this is me editing the video. Um, so, turns out the Great Migratory Period was actually uh, from 300 AD to 400 AD, from the transition from the Classical Age to the Early Middle Ages. Um, I have no idea why I got this wrong. <laughs> it's a lot of religions starting to kind of blend into each other. And at the crossroads of this giant blending of cultures and religions was where we are now, Frisia or the Netherlands. A lot of beliefs got syncreticized, so uh, beliefs from Germania and beliefs from Gaul and even from the Roman Empire started to mix together as people moved to other places. Frisia had a very Germanic belief system at first, uh, with gods from, well, what became Norse mythology, like Thor, Odin, and Loke. But it kind of blended in with tribes from Gaul and the Romans later on. One of these probably Celtic goddesses was Baduhenna, who, according to Martin Luk from a pagan blog, link in the description, was very much linked to uh, an, a Celtic goddess called but the... Here's, here's the name. <laughs> Sorry to my Irish viewers, I have no idea how to pronounce that. I very much strongly agree with the link of Bad... This name... <laughs> to Badihenna. Because the, Gaul the Gaulish counterpart to this one is Kathubadia. And I don't feel like I need to really point out the linguistic similarities in both names. Kathu Bodua and Paduhenna. They're essentially just a mix up the same syllables. The name Baduhenna can be split up into two parts. The first one, Badu, comes from the Proto Germanic word Badwa, which means war or battle. Uh, the second part, Henna, the two main leading hypotheses as to what Enna means is that it's a suffix for a Celtic goddess or that it comes from the Proto Germanic Venas which means to thrive or to win in battle. So her name could be translated as battle goddess or as she who thrives in battle. Both Kathubodwa and Baduhenna are goddesses of war, which we know because Baduhenna is linked to Kathubodwa and Kathubodwa is linked to the Irish goddess Badkatha. Both Baduhenna and Kathubodwa have a wood named after them, which we know for Baduhenna is the Baduhenna wild. Which means that the idea of this deity having a connection to the land and some kind of sovereignty carried over from Gaul to the Netherlands. We know of this goddess and the Baduhenawout thanks to the writings of Tacitus on the Frisian Rebellion. 
Tacitus writes, Later, it was learned from defectors that 900 Romans were killed in the so-called Baduhenna Forest, after they managed to extend the battle to the next day, and that another division of 400 Romans fled to the villa of a man named Cryptorix, who once served as a soldier, and stabbed each other when they feared betrayal. We don't really have anything more to go off other than that. Um, Tacitus only mentions her in, her in his writings on the Freedom Rebellion, and we haven't really found any archaeolog archaeological evidence of her worship. So we really only know she's a goddess because her name means goddess. But step one is finding where this wood was located. So for that we have to look at other uh, paragraphs in his writings, where he mentions a fort named Castellum Flavum, uh, which was found very close to here in Felsen. We kind of don't know for sure, but I'll get into that later. It's hard to say after two millennia where all of these events took place, but we can guess with a reasonable amount of confidence uh, looking at references and other sources uh, what the area was like at the time. And now the tricky part is actually looking at the sources and guessing where it would be. And I'll get into that when we get there. Hey everyone! Now for how we know, these were the woods described by Tacitus. We looked at three different candidates. Uh, Buckham, Felserbroek and Hilo. All of these three areas were wooded areas uh, two millennia ago. Buckham, however, was the only one without a marshy environment. Um, so that rules that one out. Um, there is conflicting evidence as to uh, the name of uh, Hilo, one of the other three candidates. Uh, some sources are saying it means Holy Forest, which would give credit to the Baduhenna uh, a uh, Holy Forest being in, well, a town named Holy Forest. But actually some sources also say it could m just mean High Point, depending on your interpretation. Now for Felserbroek, which we are now, there were actually archaeological findings from around this period which could very well have been of the battle described by Tacitus. So for me that was really the deal breaker in uh, making a decision to uh, where, well, the Badu Henawa uh, was. But I am not a historian. Uh, people a lot smarter than me uh, can argue me on this point very well. <laughs> So this place, Felserbroek, is actually to me the strongest candidate for being the woods that Tacitus described in his uh, writings on the Frisian Rebellion. And uh, to me is a very strong candidate for being actually uh, the Badu Henawad described uh, in the text. So almost two millennia ago, this place was actually the site of a major battle uh, in the year 28 uh, Common Era CE. After years of being forced to pay tribute to the Romans uh, in the form of taxes, the Frisians rose up after uh, the proprietor of uh, Lesser Germania hiked up taxes. Uh, so Roman ta tax collectors, according to Tacitus, started being hung at the gallows for being tax collectors, <laughs> which is a choice. Um, but how much credibility we can lend to a Roman historian uh, describing crimes done to Romans is dubious at best. One of the tax collectors uh, fled to a fort named the Castellum Flavum, Flavum <laughs> which was actually dug up close to here, allegedly. We don't know for sure because it's been two millennia, but we're pretty sure. After a brief siege of the fort, uh, the proprietor of Lesser Germania decided to um, build up the infrastructure around here for the war. Uh, because this place used to be a giant marsh. Like, you could not march an army uh, through here. Uh, which actually came to the advantage of the Frisians because after the infrastructure was built up, um, the entire battlefield was built up into these choke points. And because the Frisians were playing defensive, uh, this basically put the Romans at a major disadvantage. Because as Tacitus writes, 
the Roman proprietor, um, a man named Lucius Apronius, sent three cohorts of light infantry and one uh, division cohort of Canaanite uh, cavalry to flank the Frisians. With the, so the three cohorts were marching uh, to the Frisian to the Frisian line, and the Canaanites were flanking. Uh, what happened to these flanking Canaanites? We do not know. Tacitus that never mentions them again. Uh, but we can deduce pretty well from what happened to the three cohorts that it did not go well. The three cohorts marched to the Frisian line, so the first cohort in front started routing because of course and almost trampling over the second so the second started routing and then the third and in the entire confusion almost 900 Romans died um, and the Frisians of course are winning because they didn't really have to do after the entire after the battle um, the 400 Romans fled to a villa of a man named Cryptorix uh, who was a veteran in the Roman army um, where the Romans started accusing each other of betrayal uh, and according to Tacitus they slaughter each other. I came into this video skeptical of a claim made by a pagan blogger named Marilyn Makes. Link as always in the description. Um, connected by the way to the Morrigan, a deity from Celtic mythology associated with madness. Um, but now rereading the account by Tacitus um, I've kind of been convinced of that argument, uh, and I'll explain why. Um, Baduena is etymologically, well, the same as Katubodwa, who is connected to uh, this deity, who I still can't pronounce, um, who is one of the three uh, more, more, one of the three this ones. <laughs> um, who make up, well, the idea of the Morrigan. Um, also, Kathu Bodwa and Bad Katha <laughs> are both personified as crows, which, well, the connection between Kathu Bodwa and Badohenna, we can also draw from that, that Badohenna was likely also personified as a crow, not a raven, a crow. Different bird. <laughs> the ravens are for Odin. However, what we know for certain is that Baduena was a Frisian war goddess, and that the Romans definitely should have put their fort sails where. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this video. Uh, this is well, obviously the first video uh, in a series I plan to do on the forgotten gods and deities of the Netherlands and Belgium and part of Germany. Also, kind of Luxembourg, if you really count them as a country, or as a people. I know this has really become white noise on uh, YouTube, but um, smash that subscribe button, I guess, and annihilate that like button, like really des destroy it. Don't forget to leave a comment uh, if you thought I missed anything, uh, if you want to correct me, because I'd love that. <laughs> Bye! <laughs>